Hello everyone and welcome to training exercise number four for LEAP uh, covering cost-benefit analysis. Uh, my name is Charlie Heaps, I'm the developer of LEAP and in this video my colleague Chris Malley from SEI's York Centre will show you how to do cost-benefit analysis in LEAP. As a reminder you can get a PDF copy of the LEAP training exercises here leap.sei.org slash training and in leap you can open the included Fredonia data set then use menu option area revert to version to see answer keys corresponding to the end of each section of the exercises many other training exercises and videos are available on the leap youtube channel at leap.sei.org slash youtube over to you chris Hello everybody and welcome to this tutorial, this step-by-step -step guide for LEAP training exercise 4, cost-benefit analysis. In this exercise we're going to enter data to describe the costs of various demand and supply technologies. We're going to use LEAP to do an integrated cost-benefit analysis of different policy scenarios. This exercise builds on the data that has been entered in the training exercises one, introduction to LEAP, two, energy demand, and exercise three, energy transformation. So we recommend that if you haven't done those exercises that you go back and do them first before this cost benefit analysis exercise. Okay, let's get started with section 4.1, cost benefit analysis in LEAP, a brief introduction. LEAP performs cost-benefit analysis calculations from a societal perspective by comparing the cost of any two policy scenarios. We can include the following cost elements in LEAP. We can look at demand costs, capital and operating and maintenance costs, expressed as total cost, cost per activity, or cost of energy saved relative to a, a, some other scenario. We can look at transformation capital costs, we can look at transformation fixed and variable operating and maintenance costs, the cost of resources and imported uh, fuels, the economic benefits of exported fuels, externality costs from emissions of pollutants, and other user-defined costs, such as the cost of administering an efficiency program. To set up a costing analysis in LEAP, we need to draw a consistent boundary around our system so that LEAP won't double count the costs. And benefits. For example, if we count the costs of the fuels used to generate electricity, we should not also count the cost of the electricity in the overall cost-benefit calculation. The first thing that we need to do is um, to switch on the costing uh, capabilities in LEAP in the settings screen. This data set here is the data set that has been completed up until the end of exercise 3. The first thing I'm going to do is go to the settings screen and check the box called costs. We're now going to go to the costing tab and select the boundary that will be drawn around the system. For this exercise, we're going to select the complete energy system as our, um, as our, as our boundary, meaning that fuel costs are accounted for only when they are imported or exported or when indigenously produced fuels are extracted as a primary resource. The discount rate we're going to apply is 5%. We're now going to start by constructing a set of policy scenarios that will be analyzed. And we're then going to create those policy scenarios to implement the, the measures that are being represented by those scenarios and enter the cost data relevant for those scenarios in the demand, the transformation and the resource costs. Then we're going to look at the costing results in an overall cost benefit comparison for these different scenarios. Let's go to section 4.2, creating policy scenarios. And it tells us to first go to the scenario screen in our analysis view. And we're going to create five policy scenarios directly underneath the baseline for efficient lighting, efficient refrigerators, natural gas buses natural gas and renewable electricity generation, and industrial efficiency. We no longer need the demand side management scenario from exercise one, so we're going to first delete that scenario. 
So I'm going to click add and I'm going to start with efficient lighting. I'm then going to click add and add efficient refrigerators. I'm going to click add again for CNG buses. I'm always clicking on the baseline so that the uh, policy scenarios are added directly underneath the baseline and, in, and inherit the expressions from it. Gas and renewables is my next scenario. And finally, industrial efficiency is my final scenario. I can't call it industrial efficiency because efficiency is a reserved name in LEAP. So I'm going to have to rename it efficient industry. We're finally going to create one more scenario. Section 4.2 tells us to create a mitigation scenario under the baseline that is the combination of the five policy scenarios. We want to use the inheritance tab to set this scenario to inherit the expressions from the five policy scenarios. So under baseline, I'm going to have a scenario called mitigation. I'm going to place that at the bottom of my scenarios. If I look at inheritance here, I can then click add and I can add in my five policy scenarios. And what this does is it, the, it allows the mitigation scenario to look at all of those five policy scenarios together. So we've now created our, our five policy scenarios and that overall mitigation scenario. So we can then click close. In section 4.3, entering costing data, we are going to enter the data that will be used to evaluate how these scenarios differ from the baseline scenario. In general, the unit costs, the way that we represent the cost of different technologies are the same for different scenarios, but the scenarios will differ in, how, in terms of how much each technology is implemented or how much of each fuel is consumed. Therefore, we need to enter the cost data in the current account scenario. And after that, we will enter data describing the penetration of the technology in the different policy scenarios. So we're going to start with our demand side options first. Uh, the efficient lighting, efficient refrigeration and efficient industry. And to do that, we need to specify three types of data. The technology penetration, so how many of a new type of device will be installed in each policy scenario. The technology performance, how efficient the new devices are. And the technology cost, how much do the new devices cost? And we can specify this in two ways in, uh, in LEAP. We can specify this technology cost either as the total cost of competing devices used in the baseline and policy scenarios, or we can simply enter the incremental cost of the new devices introduced in the policy scenarios relative to the cost of devices used in the baseline scenarios. So just the incremental difference in cost between the technologies used in different scenarios. And we will do examples of both of those in this exercise. Section 4.3.1 is related to our efficient lighting scenario. And we're told before we enter any information about the cost data, we need to create a new branch under the urban lighting folder to represent our new efficient technology. So I'm going to go to demand to households and the efficient lighting only applies to urban households. And at the moment, I only have one branch for electricity. Um, in lighting. The first thing I'm going to do is right click and click properties and rename that my existing lighting branch. And then I'm going to right click and click add. My fuel is still electricity, but I'm going to call this my efficient lighting branch. And 
this is not um, uh, the percent share here is not 100 it's zero in the current accounts and in my baseline scenario my all of my lighting is existing lighting and I'm going to represent that with a remainder 100 rather than um, you know entering 100 directly okay so the first type of data that we want to enter is the technology penetration a program to install efficient lighting systems could reduce electricity consumed in urban households using compact uh, fluorescent lighting CFL and other technologies we're going to assume that this program starts in 2012 and can reach 40% of households by 2017 and 75% by 2040 so we're now changing our values under efficient lighting to look at the penetration of that technology. We're saying inter 2012 is going to be zero, but by 2017, 40% of households will be covered. And by 2040, 75% of households will be covered. So we've now uh, represented the uh, penetration of that new efficient lighting technology. Now our um, efficient lighting can be assumed to consume only 30% of the electricity used by conventional lighting in urban households. So we're going to enter this data under um, uh, the final energy intensity variable. But we're going to do this in current accounts. So the um, efficiency of our efficient lighting is 30% as good as the existing lighting. So we can write 400 times 0 0.3 for our efficient lighting, uh, for our, our lighting um, efficiency. Finally, we can then enter the technology cost. We're told that standard light bulbs cost $1 each, but they have a lifetime of only one year. Efficient light bulbs cost $6, so they're more expensive, but they last for three years. Each household is assumed to have five working lights. So we want to enter this, value, enter this information in current accounts for the demand cost variable. We'll enter this data per household to make sure that uh, we we want to make sure that we're entering this data per household, the cost per household. And um, to do that, we're going to select the activity cost method. So we have different cost methods here, and ours is the activity cost method. We're going to use the annualized cost function to specify the annualized cost of both the existing and the efficient technologies. Um, per household per year. The annualized cost for the efficient light bulb, we're given the value in section 4.3.1. Our expression is annualized cost and then six for the price of the uh, light bulb times five because we have five light bulbs per house and they last three years. So that's how we enter that um, expression. We can then enter the analogous expression for existing light bulbs. They cost $1 and we need five of them and they only last one year. So that's our equivalent expression for uh, the existing light bulb, uh, the existing light bulbs. So I'm going to click save. We've now created the efficient lighting scenario in terms of how it changes over time. We've entered the energy intensity and how it changes over, um, uh, we've entered the energy intensity and we've entered the cost data. So that's our efficient lighting scenario set up with the cost information into. Section 4.3.2 includes our efficient refrigerator scenario. 
or um, provides the information for our efficient refrigerator scenario. It tells us that the government is considering introducing a new efficiency standard for refrigerators. This will start in 2014. By 2025, all urban refrigerators, not rural refrigerators, will be assumed to meet the new standard. Okay, so this is similar to the lighting scenario. We need to create a second branch for our more efficient refrigerators. So I'm going to rename my first branch existing. And I'm going to rename, I'm going to add a second branch and call it efficient with the fuel still as um, uh, electricity. So in my current accounts, the efficient lighting is zero and I'm going to specify remainder 100 for the existing so that the changes in future scenarios um, uh, will automatically update the proportion of existing refrigerators. And then in my efficient refrigerator scenario, I'm going to create my expression. We're told that the uh, policy will start in 2014. By 2025, 100% of our refrigerators in urban households will meet the new standard. So now we've entered that policy. Let's go back to our current accounts and look at the energy intensity. And we're told that the, under technology performance, the standard would require that manufacturers produce refrigerators with an average energy intensity of 380 kilowatt hours per year. So now we enter under current accounts 380 to say how efficient our um, refrigerators are. Now we get to the technology cost which we also enter under demand. We're told the cost of improving refrigerator efficiency to 380 kilowatt hours, which we've just entered under final energy intensity, that cost is about 100 US dollars per fridge. Both the current and the efficient refrigerators have a lifetime of about 10 years. So in this example, we've only been given data describing the incremental cost of the new efficient device. So when entering the data for the demand cost variable in current accounts, we're going to specify a cost of zero for the existing refrigerators and then annualize the $100 incremental cost over the 10 year lifetime of the refrigerator. So to do this, our existing refrigerator, the cost is zero. And we are only entering the incremental cost, the incremental cost of having an efficient rather than existing refrigerator. So we want to enter, enter the, the annualized cost, which is $100 and the lifetime, 10 years. So we're told that it's worth noting to do a cost benefit analysis. We do not need to specify all of the costs of a scenario. We only need to specify how one scenario's costs differ from another's. And that's exactly what we've done here. What we've entered here is just the difference in cost between existing and efficient appliances, refrigerators in this case. So we move on now to section 4.3.3, industrial energy efficiency. This is our final demand scenario. In the other industrial sector of Fredonia, energy is used in a wide variety of different processes. An energy audit of selected industries estimated that energy consumption can be reduced through a variety of measures at an average cost of about five cents per kilowatt hour saved. These measures have the potential to save up to 30% of the energy consumed in other industry by 2040. So unlike the other two demand scenarios we've created for efficient lighting and efficient refrigeration, for this type of analysis, the cost information is not available in a way that allows us to count up the number of new devices that will be installed and the cost of each of those. Instead, we'll have to specify the cost by entering the cost per unit of saved energy. So let's first go to our industry sector and the sector that we're interested in is other industries. We're told in current accounts, select the demand cost variable for the electricity and fuel oil branches under other industry. 
Now we want to select the cost of energy saved option from the cost method screen. When we do that, we get this pop out box and in it, we need to choose units of US dollar per kilowatt hour of energy saved. And we want to compare that versus the baseline scenario rather than current accounts. So then we're going to click OK. So to do that again for a residual fuel oil, I click on cost of energy saved and I want to save it US dollars per kilowatt hour of energy saved compared to the baseline scenario. Once we've done that, we can then enter what that cost number is, which is 0.05 US dollars, 5 cents per kilowatt hour of electricity saved for both electricity and residual fuel oil. So that's us entered the cost information. The next part of this is to then select the industrial efficiency scenario, the efficient industry scenario, and specify the energy savings that can be expected from implementing this policy. In, in section 4.3.3, we're told that one way to do this is to select the final energy intensity variable that is specified under other industries, and then enter the uh, equation, the expression, which tells LEAP that the energy intensity will be 30% less than in the baseline scenario by 2040. So to do that, we can enter the expression as it's written in section 4.3.3 to start off by saying that it will be the baseline value, so the value of the energy intensity in the baseline, multiplied by an interp function that says in 2010 it will be 1, so that means it will be the same as the baseline. In 2040, it will be the baseline value multiplied by 0 point, uh, 0.7. So you can see the effect of that expression is to gradually decrease the energy intensity by 30% over the time period of our analysis to 2040. Our final demand scenario is CNG buses. Switching buses from diesel to CNG is a good option because it can improve air quality in densely populated in polluted cities, as well as mitigating CO2 emissions. CNG buses could be introduced in 2012. By 2017, they could meet 7% of total bus passenger kilometers. And by 2040, this could reach 70%. So let's go back to our transport analysis. I'm going to go into current accounts first. Back to our transport analysis. We're interested here in passenger transport because we're thinking about buses and road passenger transport. And at the moment, the only fuel that we have under our buses is diesel. So let's first add a second fuel and we have CNG there. So now we have a space for entering our CNG buses. And again, we're going to change that to zero in current accounts and I'm going to change diesel to remain to 100. I'm then going to go to my CNG buses scenario. We can start to introduce our CNG buses in 2012. And by 2017, they could meet 7% of our total bus passenger kilometers. And by 2040, that would increase to 70%. So that's our technology penetration. We now need to enter our technology performance. And I'm going to do this in current accounts. So diesel buses will consume 0 0.00833 liters per passenger kilometer. Natural gas powered CNG buses use 0 0.29 megajoules per passenger kilometer. Section 4.3.4 of the training exercise tells us that this is slightly less than the final energy intensity of diesel buses in the base year. Technology cost. CNG buses cost $0.1 per passenger kilometre more than existing buses, but these costs are annualised over the 15-year lifetime of the buses. And our demand costs here are the activity cost, and we can see that it's US dollar per passenger kilometer. 
The cost information that we've been providing in this scenario is similar to the refrigeration scenario rather than the lighting scenario. CNG buses are $0.1 per passenger kilometer more than existing buses and their lifetime is 15 years. So in diesel buses, we're going to keep the expression as zero. And for CNG buses, we're going to enter an expression annualized cost 0.1 annualized over 15 years. So that's us created our four demand scenarios, including the cost component. I'm going to move now to transformation costs. And we're told that wind and natural gas can bind cycle plants will be included in our mitigation scenario, our gas and, and renewable energy scenario. Before entering the costing data, we need to create the new branches for both of these technologies and their performance characteristic. And we're given these characteristics in the table in section 4.3.5. So we're now not looking in demand, we're looking in transformation and electricity generation. And we want to create two new processes. So I'm going to click add. I'm going to enter new wind first. My feedstock fuel is wind and the name is new wind. I'm then going to add natural gas as a power uh, plant and I'm going to call it new NGCC. So I've now got my two power plants and I want to enter the characteristics that are specified in the table. The first thing that I want to change is to change their dispatch rule to match our other power plants and to dispatch them based on merit order. So I'm going to change the dispatch rule to merit order dispatch. My first simulation year is the first scenario year. The merit order for both is one, which is correct. The process efficiency for wind, we enter 100%, 55% efficient for our natural gas combined cycle power plants. The maximum availability for wind is 35% and for natural gas is 80%. The capacity credit is uh, uh, 30% for wind, 100% for natural gas. And we're given a note in the um, exercise, the capacity credit variable takes into account the proportion of uh, capacity that is fixed due to the intermittency of renewable technologies. This means that all technologies other than wind um, have a capacity credit of 100%. So let's, our capacity credit to 30%. Uh, percent. Historical production, as you'd expect, because these are new power plants, is zero for both wind and for natural gas. Our exogenous capacity in current accounts is also zero. We don't have any of these in our, in our base year. And the lifetime, 30 years, which is what we have entered here um, already. So we've created our new, um, new power plants, which is excellent. For transformation, we need to specify the cost for all of the various power plants and fuels that may be affected by the changes from the demand measures. We're going to start by specifying the capital costs and fixed and variable operating and maintenance costs of the different electric generation power plants in our system. And we're given a table to enter this data in LEAP. So if we look at um, the um, the table in section 4.3.5, we're given the capital costs, the fixed operating and maintenance cost, the variable operating and maintenance cost, and the interest rate. And we're told that the costs that we're given do not include the fuel costs because we're going to deal with them later when we look at the resource cost information. The first thing that I need to do to make sure that I can enter this cost information is to ensure that the cost box here is checked under the electricity generation module. So I right click on electricity generation, click on properties 
and make sure that this cost variable is checked. I then click on processes and I now have all of the um, all of the tabs needed to enter my cost information. So for example, for my existing coal steam plants, the capital cost is $1,000 per kilowatt of capacity. My units here are per megawatt of capacity. So we need to make sure that we convert this into the, we need to make sure that we have the correct variables entered here for the um, for the um, uh, uh, for, for the units of electricity that we're talking about. We have megawatts of capacity here and in our table it's kilowatts, uh, dollar per kilowatt. So here one thousand dollar per kilowatt is equivalent to a um, million dollars per megawatt. So a million dollars per megawatt for existing coal steam, two million dollars per megawatt for existing hydro, and four hundred dollars per kilowatt, which is equivalent to four hundred thousand dollars per megawatt of capacity for our oil combustion turbines. For new coal steam, it's again a million. For new oil combustion turbines, it's 400,000. For new wind, it's 800,000. And for new natural gas, 500,000. That's our capital costs. Our fixed operation and maintenance costs, again, in the table, they're listed as dollar per kilowatt of capacity. Here we have dollar per megawatt of capacity, so we need to multiply by 1,000. Um, for coal steam, $40,000 per megawatt of capacity. For hydro, zero. For oil combustion turbine, 10,000. New coal steam, uh, 40,000, sorry. Oil combustion turbine, 10,000. 10,000 for wind and 25,000 for our, um, oh sorry, I've got that the wrong way round. 10,000 for um, gas and 25,000 for wind. Let me just make sure I haven't made a mistake um, under the capital cost. No, 800,000 for wind, 500,000 for oil combustion turbine. Okay. Our variable operation and maintenance costs are in units of US dollar per gigajoule here, but we can change that to units of um, dollar per megawatt hour. And we can enter them in exactly the same um, um, units as are in section 4.3.5 of the LEAP training manual. So our existing coal steam is three, our existing hydro is one, our existing oil combustion turbine 0 0.7. New coal steam is three, new oil combustion turbine is 0 0.7, new wind zero, new natural gas 0 0.5. And our interest rates, we can enter as, it has been entered here as the discount rate. If we go back to settings and to our costs, we see here that the discount rate is 5%. So we don't need to make any change here. The discount rate, uh, the interest rate is, is the same as in the exercise. We can now move to section 4.3.6, natural gas and renewable scenario. So in the baseline scenario, coal steam and oil combustion turbines were assumed to be the main types of power plants that are going to be built in the future. If we recall, these data were specified using the endogenous capacity variable. The endogenous capacity variable. So let's look at the baseline. We have our endogenous capacity here as new coal steam, oil combustion turbines. 
In the natural gas and renewable scenario, we're going to ex instead look at the impact of building a different mix of power plants in the future. In this scenario, we will analyze the impact of building a mix of natural gas, combined cycle, and wind power plants for our base load, plus some oil combustion turbines to meet the peak load requirements. So we're told in section 4.3.6 to select gas and renewables as our scenario and in the endogenous capacity screen replace the baseline scenario data with our new natural gas, new oil combustion turbine and new wind uh, information. So I'm going to delete the two plants that were being built there in the baseline in this new gas and renewable scenario and add first my new natural gas, then new oil, and then new wind to have the correct addition order. The addition size, my new natural gas power plants will be 400 megawatts, my new oil combustion turbine 200 megawatts, and my new wind will be 200 megawatts of capacity. Finally, we're going to turn to section 4.3.7. Under the resource section of the tree, we're going to specify the costs for domestically produced and imported primary resources and secondary fuels. So let's have a look under our resources category. We've got primary resources, secondary resources. If I click on primary resources, we can put in the import cost and the endogenous cost of our different types of fuel. We're going to do this first in current accounts. And we're given in section 4.3.7 the costs of our primary resources and our secondary resources in current accounts and for our projections into the future. We're going to enter the base year cost data in, in current accounts since all scenarios assume the same costs. The cost projections we only need to enter once under the baseline scenario. They're going to be the same in all of the mitigation scenarios. And we're also told to make sure the fuel cost variable for each of the feedstock fuels associated with each of the electricity generation processes refers to the indigenous cost variable in the resources branches. So if we go back to electricity generation and to our new oil combustion turbine and our feedstock fuel, if we go to fuel cost, at the moment it's set to zero. The fuel cost should refer to the cost, the indigenous cost of residual fuel oil for our new oil combustion turbine. So we can enter the expression that was in the exercise in section 4.3.7 to point the fuel cost variable to our residual fuel oil cost. And it shouldn't, it should be the residual fuel oil and the indigenous cost variable, US dollar per ton. And we need to make sure that that is also set to US dollar per ton. So it's the correct value. So let's first, before we enter the resource costs themselves, let's make sure that in our electricity generation, that the fuel cost, the cost of the fuel that is being used to generate the electricity, is going to be read from our resource branches. So we've, we've done that for the residual fuel oil in the new oil combustion turbines. Let's do it now for natural gas in our combined cycle natural gas. So that should be an expression that starts with resources and natural gas is a primary resource. It's natural gas and it's indigenous cost. And that is in US dollars per meter cubed. Let's see if we can enter US dollar per cubic meter. Okay, for wind and for hydro, we don't need to enter the fuel costs there, but we do for coal. So for coal bituminous, our fuel costs, 
under resources and it's a primary resource and co-bituminous and indigenous cost so we have that and that is in units of US dollar per ton so let's align the units here our existing oil combustion turbine has exactly the same expression as our new oil combustion turbine it's a secondary fuel residual fuel oil indigenous cost and again US dollar per ton so let's change this to metric ton to align our units one more existing coal steam and this is exactly the same as our new coal steam power plants resources primary coal bituminous indigenous cost so that's US dollar per metric ton We've now entered all of the information that we uh, that we've now um, entered the information to make sure that the fuel cost, the cost of the fuel needed to generate electricity, is taken from the correct resources branch. What we need to do now is to enter the import and the indigenous cost of each of the fuels that we are using. So let's do that first for our primary resources. So bituminous coal will be $20 per ton in um, to import and to produce domestically in 2010. So our import and our indigenous cost in 2010 will be $20 per ton. Natural gas will be $0.1 per meter cubed and crude oil will be $30 per ton. And I'm entering those for import and for domestic or in indigenous production. Let's now enter the expression of how these are going to change into the future. For natural gas, it's going to be $0.2 per meter cubed in 2040 so I can enter 2040 0 0.2 crude oil is going to be $50 per ton in 2040 and coal is going to be $30 per ton in 2040. So that's the import, the domestic production is exactly the same. 0 0.2 for natural gas, fifty for crude oil, and thirty for bituminous coal. Okay, so now we've entered the current accounts and the projection of our costs of our primary fuels. Let's go to our secondary fuels. For diesel, gasoline, LPG, kerosene, residual fuel oil, avgas and lubricants, they will be $300 per ton in 2010. All our oil products have the same indigenous cost and import cost. 300. In the baseline scenario, that's going to increase to four hundred dollars per ton
a good shortcut if we want to copy the same expression down a list is to select where we want to enter the expression and press Control and D. Control D copies the expression directly above into the current expression box. So it saves a lot of time when typing those expressions to just press Control D multiple times to enter uh, uh, to enter the expre same expression multiple times. I can do the same here. 20, 40, 400. I can press Control D all the way down. So now I've entered the information on the secondary resources import and domestic production costs. And we're warned or, or it's highlighted in section 4.3.7 that electricity is not priced here since we are modeling electricity uh, costs instead on the basis of the input fuel and power plant costs. Let's move on now to the section 4.3.8, environmental loadings or emissions. This is the final part of the cost benefit analysis to be able to accurately calculate the costs of avoided emissions in these scenarios. We need to ensure that the appropriate emission factors have been assigned wherever a fuel is combusted in leak. We did this in section 1.5 for some of our fuels. We're now going to add emission factors to all branches by right clicking on the tree and adding the IPCC tier one factors to all the branches, checking that each branch where we want to add emission factors. In this exercise, we're only going to focus on the combustion related emissions. So let's start in households. We don't have anything to enter. We've already entered the key emission factors for all of the types of fuels that um, are combusted and that, um, uh, th that result in emissions. Under demand, we don't add emission factors for electricity because those emissions from the combustion of electricity generation are taken into account under transformation. In industry, we have some emission factors to add because we have combustion of coal. So I'm going to right click and click add multiple effects and I'm going to add the IPCC tier one default coal emission factors. We can see what those emission factors are under average environmental loading. I'm going to do the same for natural gas. And the motive power is electricity, so I'm not going to account for those emissions here. Pulp and paper, we have biomass emissions, wood emissions, taking the IPCC default, and electricity for motive power. For residual fuel oil in other industries, I'm going to add multiple effects and use the IPCC tier one emission factors for oil. In the transport sector, I have emissions from gasoline for cars. And we've directed to transport road gasoline. And for buses, I have diesel and CNG emissions. I'm going to add multiple effects and add the emissions for diesel and for CNG. For rail, I'm only going to add the emission factors for um, for for diesel because for electricity I don't have uh, the emissions will be taken into account under transformation for freight I can do the same adding the emission factors under diesel commercial heating I'm going to add the emission factors for residual fuel oil and for natural gas. Then we get under transformation and we're going to only add the emission factors under the electricity generation sector. We have existing coal already added, existing oil combustion turbine already added. So let's add new coal steam we have 
new oil combustion turbine we added in exercise one. So the only additional emission factors we need are under natural gas. So we now have the emission factors under natural gas and all of our uh, combustion emissions added to LEAP. Let's move on now to section 4.4, the cost benefit results. In the scenario screen, we can check the check boxes on the tree to indicate which scenario should be calculated. To keep the results as simple as possible, at first we only are only going to check the baseline and mitigation scenarios. So if you click on the scenarios button here, we have the different scenarios that we can calculate. The more scenarios we calculate, the longer it takes for LEAP to run the results. So if we just select baseline and just select mitigation, it will run faster. And the mitigation includes the implementation of all of these policies that are represented under these individual scenarios. So if we just click on baseline and mitigation, then we should see the overall effect of implementing everything together and we can compare it to the baseline. So in section 4.4, we're told that in the summaries view, we can now display the net present value of the mitigation scenario relative to another selected scenario. In this case, we're going to compare it to the baseline. The net present value is the sum of all discounted costs and benefits in one scenario minus another, summing across all years of the study. So let's click on the summaries view. And we can then click on the cost benefit scenario. We can now see the net present value of the costs and benefits relative to the baseline scenario with a discount rate of 5%. When we look at the results, we can see that on the demand side, the costs are more than the benefits, but this is a bit offset by the savings in the transformation module and in avoided fuel requirements due to the energy saved on the demand side. The overall net pr present value is how much more the mitigation scenario costs versus the baseline scenario. The cost of avoided greenhouse gas emissions is given by dividing the net present value by the tons of carbon dioxide equivalent emissions avoided. I hope this has been a useful tutorial on how to look at costs and benefits in LEAP. Good luck with your own analyses. Thank you very much for watching.